Sir Hatchporch here, and uh, this time I thought I'd try something a little bit different. Um, basically, I got this idea from a guy on here named Darren Locke, and what he does is he listens to an album all the way through and has you sync up the album with him, and then he gives a sort of running commentary for it. Uh, I really enjoy his videos when he does it, and I thought it might be something fun to try. And um, I thought for my first attempt I would do a commentary for this album, the Beatles' Let It Be Naked. Now, uh, I'm doing this for a couple of reasons. Uh, one being, you know, I, I put up a very low quality video four years ago on me, um, uh, with me unboxing the Beatles in Mono box set, and this video really took off. I believe it has around 30,000 hits now, and gets um, views and comments still, you know, to this day, regularly. Uh, so I thought there might be some interest in me doing uh, another Beatle video. <clears throat> now, I did extensive research on this album back in 2003 when it came out and wrote a piece for my website where I talked about take numbers and recording dates and, and exactly what was done to the songs here. So I thought, you know, I, I would do a running commentary and kind of uh, read from the article that I had written and maybe add some more thoughts, you know, here and there. Um, now, you know, real, real quick backstory on this album. I'm sure everybody knows this by now. Um, it started out as a project called Get Back in January 1969. It was an intent... It, the intention was to um, get back to their roots and record something um, a little more uh, basic, a little more raw. So they began, they began rehearsing at Twickenham Studios which is basically a film studio, and they began running through songs, and, and they appeared kind of bored, and uh, things weren't going so well. There was a lot of conflict, and George Harrison actually ended up leaving the band for a brief amount of time. Now, when he came back, he brought keyboardist Billy Preston in to sort of placate the mood and add um, some additional instrumentation, being, you know, keyboards, and the mood improved, you know, greatly. They moved the sessions down to the basement of Apple Studios and got down to business. And on January 30th, the five of them performed uh, a concert on the rooftop of Apple Studios. The next day, they recorded three songs in the basement of Apple, three songs that hadn't been suitable for uh, live performance you know, on the rooftop. And at that point, they kind of just shelved the project. Um, didn't know what they wanted to do with it, and eventually got on to, re you know, recording a proper studio album with Abbey Road, which was much more studio-oriented, kind of abandoned the ethos of this project. Now, uh, their engineer, Glenn Johns, attempted twice to to compile, you know, the best of these sessions for an, a potential Get Back album. Both were rejected soundly by the band, and these tapes sort of sat on the shelf until... Um, 1970, when producer Phil Spector was called in by uh, George Harrison and John Lennon to kind of clean up the tapes and um, and make something releasable as a soundtrack to the film which was about to come out. So basically, Paul McCartney was very aggrieved once he heard what had happened to his track The Long and Winding Road, specifically where Phil Spector had overdubbed brass and choir and orchestra. And um, this pretty much led to Paul leaving the band in April of 1970. This was the final straw. There had been a lot of tension and conflict up to this point, but this was the, the final straw for him. And um, so in 2002, Paul McCartney met um, or ran into Michael Lindsay Hogg, who was the director of the film. And just by chance, they ran into each other on a plane flight. And they began talking about the lack of availability of this movie on DVD. And then they sort of hit upon the idea of perhaps revisiting the music and remixing things and coming up with a new album. So um, the DVD still has not seen the light of day, but we did get this album in 2003. So, basically what I'm going to do is just sort of walk you through everything, give as much information as I can, and also clear up a lot of the 
conceptions about this album that have come out through the years because there's been a lot of uh, false information, um, some of which, in my opinion, has been on the part of, of Apple itself, uh, especially the press releases that came out around the time of the release of this album. So, um, basically what I'm going to do is count you down three, two, one, and then I'll say play, and on the word play, you click play. All right. Three, two, one, play. So right off the top here, you, you notice that uh, it's quite a bit drier than um, previous mixes of this song. Uh, for the entire album, bass, drums, and all vocals are dead center, which is quite different than um, the original mixes, especially in terms of vocals. Uh, now, this song had no take number. It was recorded on January 27, 1969 same exact take that Spectre had chosen for the album and the same take that appears on the single version. Now the chief difference here is there's no um, intro you know, dialogue that you heard on the album and no outro uh, that Spectre had taken from the uh, rooftop concert and kind of tacked it on to the end of the album version. Now there's also no coda as heard in the single version. The coda was recorded the following day uh, when they went back into the studio and tried to to, re to record more takes of the song. They couldn't get a usable take, but they did get takes of coda, so they kind of tacked that on to the previous day's recording. Now, yeah, the, as I said, this, this excises that coda. It's just the, the bear track from January 27th. Now, basically, what they did is um, three engineers from Abbey Road, um, Paul Hicks, Alan Rouse, and Guy Massey, were approached by Neil Aspinall to create a new version of this album. So what they did is they went back to all the multi-track tapes and, you know, put them all through Pro Tools and, tools and cleaned up each individual track of the multi-tracks. Um, and remixed everything. They tried to take out, you know, tape hiss, little noises that, you know, were here and there, and really come up with some clean remixes of these songs. Now, this was from the Rooftop Concert, January 30th, 1969. Same exact take Phil Spector had chosen. In fact, most of these are the same exact takes that Spector had chosen, as you will see. Again, you know, no dialogue from the, the rooftop at the beginning or the end. They really wanted all these mixes to be very tight and just the songs, nothing else. Um, re this retains the same edits that Phil Spector had done to the song. Now, some people don't know this, but there was a section at the beginning and end of this song where they're singing all I want is and it's a little clumsy uh, you can hear it on bootleg versions and in the film and Phil Spector just edited those out and you know these engineers did as well and that's kind of funny because you know I've read an interview with these engineers and they kind of denied being influenced by Phil Spector's cut um, but they actually retained most of the takes that he chose and emulated a couple of the edits that he did. Now, one thing that really bothers me is, um, and uh, this is something I never noticed until somebody pointed it out to me, that's how subtle it is. They digitally pitch-shifted uh, one of John Lennon's sung notes here, and I will point it out in just a second. 
<clears throat> you'll you'll see <clears throat> right here. And the original, you know, he kind of overshot the note, so someone made the decision to digitally pitch correct it, which I think is a little excessive. Um, I. I don't understand that level of obsessiveness. Um, I can understand somewhat kind of going back and revisiting these tracks and remixing them and taking a lot of the more bombastic overdubs out, but that seems a little ridiculous. Now, another problem I have with this version is the electric guitars sound very neutered to me. Um, you know, some of the roughness and rawness is kind of taken off them. Kind of the, the hair is taken off, you know. So these guitars sound a little lifeless to me, um, personally. And one nice thing is Billy Preston's organ parts have been brought out quite a bit in comparison to the original mixes. Now there's also an error to edit right there. John Lennon kind of went into the guitar riff too early on the original mix. He went down it down it. They just kind of mix that out. Now this next mix um, I actually think is an improvement uh, this is For You Blue. This was take six, recorded January 25th, 1969, uh, with one overdub on January 8th, 1970, of a new lead vocal. Identical to the one that Spectre chose again, um, but um, George's acoustic guitar part is mixed back, and you can hear right there. For some bizarre reason, Phil Spector decided to edit that out of the original mix, and I think it adds so much to this. It kind of gives it a more free, um, I don't know, a little more light-hearted, free-spirited kind of feel. And it's really nice too. It's actually a little more challenging than it um, than it sounds. It's real fun to play, fun line to play. Now, as I said, the press kind of bothered me. <clears throat> that was put out to accompany this album. It even says, you know, on a sticker on the front, um, the band's cut from the original sessions. This is just, you know, kind of nonsense. Um, you know, it was going to be a lot more raw than Let It Be or, or even this. As I said, you know, Glenn Johns compiled it a few times, and this, these were rejected, even though that was in keeping with what they said they had wanted. Um, so it, it seems like they really weren't sure of what they wanted, whether they wanted a nice, clean album, or they wanted, you know, a bunch of rough takes. The original Get Back LPs that Glenn Johns compiled had cover songs and dialogue and things like that. <clears throat> but apparently the Beatles didn't Beatles didn't want to issue that. Long and Winding Road. Now this is a completely different take. Um, the one that Spectre had chosen was the first ever recorded run through of that song. It was basically just a rehearsal really. Um, and that had been recorded on January 26th, 1969, Phil Spector took that overdubbed brass, strings, and choir, and uh, some new drums played by Ringo, and also mixed out uh, a spoken word thing that Paul had done in the middle, and a little piano run that he did at the end. Um, 
Now this is the final take ever recorded, and it's you know, quite a bit tighter. This is take 19, done January 31st. As I said, it was done in the Apple basement. Um, and this is the version that appears in the film as well. Now, this is pretty much as is, but um, Paul did a little scat vocal in the middle, in the bridge, and that's been mixed out. And obviously, there's no brass strings or choir. Now, there's a lyrical variation here, which is kind of interesting, considering this is the final recorded version right here. Now, when these engineers played this rough mix of this album for Paul McCartney for the first time, he kind of, you know, reacted to that and was like, whoa, what's that? Which is interesting, you know, this is the final version ever recorded. And you could make the case that, well, that was the polished lyric. That was the one, you know, that was the way it was supposed to be um, released. But for some reason, you know, Phil Spector issued that sort of slightly sloppy first take. So basically just a rehearsal. And uh, that, the, that original lyric is the one that everybody knows. And the one that even Paul has performed through the years. So I don't know if he just forgot that he changed the lyric, or didn't care, or just wanted to stay true to the version that people knew. But that is kind of interesting. Now on um, on the on that rehearsal take, you know, that formed the basis for the famous version that everybody knows. Um, Phil Spector even mixed out. Um, he he wiped a track on the multi-tracks to make room for his or uh, overdubs. And I know that really made Paul McCartney mad. I mean, nobody had ever done that in their career, just sort of come in and, um, you know, record it over material that they had recorded. So that was a big point of contention. I'm not sure if I like that better than the original. I, I, I'm kind of... It's not one of my favorite Beatles songs, so I could probably go either way. I'm not sure. It is kind of nice, though. Uh, two of Us. Now, this is take 12. Again, identical to the one Spectre chose. Pretty similar mix. You know, again, no intro chatter and an early fade. In fact, you know, all these songs, or most of them, fade early. And sometimes it sounds a little clumsy because they had to, you know, make sure to fade it before there was fooling around in the studio or dialogue or whatever because they didn't want any of that they wanted just the songs pretty self-explanatory here um and you can really hear you know you know the vocals used to be panned and, and now they're they're right in the middle and i kind of prefer the panning of the original album i liked hearing paul and john in separate channels kind of singing at each other in a lot of these songs It's a nice song, though. It's always been one of my favorites. Not too different than, than Spectre's mix. Now, uh, another interesting thing is that, you know, I've heard an interview with Paul McCartney from around 1987, I think, 86. Long interview he did. Very, very, very interesting. I think he did it with a reporter on a cassette tape. And he talks about the original Get Back and says, yeah, you know, that was the best version, you know, that that version that no one ever heard it was the best version of that album because it was kind of raw and um, kind of subversive for us and had these mistakes in it. And he's like, oh, I really wish that would come out. But then, you know, he kind of had the opportunity to opportunity to do it and decided to go back and clean everything up and and on that note you know it's kind of funny to say well this is how the album was supposed to be um 
I mean, they're, we're using modern day technology here. Also, the tom rolls right here brought out quite a bit. Um, it's funny to say that this is the way the album was supposed to be from the beginning, but that the only way that could have been achieved was to to use modern day technology. You know, it, it doesn't really make sense to me. And then you have these strange edits like pitch shifting, and it's just a little, a little ridiculous to 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 me. But that really is funny that, you know, he was, he was talking about how great those original Get Back mixes were, but everybody rejected them in the, in the band. Nobody wanted them out. I mean, you can kind of argue that, that John and George were the main ones who, who kind of oversaw the original Let It Be album, kind of brought Phil Spector in and everything, and I think they were there for some of it. You know, Paul wasn't. Um, so you can kind of argue, well, it was two members of the band that kind of... You know, instigated the original. I've got a feeling. Now, this one is really strange. Um, this is a hybrid version of the two versions that were recorded on the rooftop uh, on January 30, 30th, 1969. So, see, this, this part is all new. This is from the second version. Um... Basically what they did is they set both versions up, you know, in Pro Tools or whatever, and kind of just mixed and matched. Well, I like Paul's vocal in this section. Uh, he has a better one in this one. Uh, the instrumentation is better in this one. And they kind of just made this Frankenstein monster um, version. And it is quite hard to go through and kind of pick out. I can mostly do it. But my understanding is there are times where you've got the backing track for one version playing and then a vocal from another playing on top of it. Now, see, all this is from the... I believe that all this is from the first version. You know, the, the first version had been used on the original Let It Be album. The first rooftop version. I see this is the second version now. Different vocal. You, you, you can tell... Um, you know, this has always been my favorite song on the album. I really like the original mix. I like that it's one complete take. I like that it's raw. I really like that John and George, uh, John and Paul's vocals were, you know, in different channels. I loved that, especially in this part where you know John comes in, and the ending part where John and Paul are together. You know. I don't. It doesn't work for me as well. Just having them right, right in the middle. And again, the guitars sound a little neutered to me. And I, I don't. I just don't think that they needed to mix and match. I. I mean, I understand you could make the case to say, well, they're going back to the tapes. They might as well try and compile the best possible version that they can with with today's technology. I just, I feel like it doesn't really need it. I, I like the original version of this song. Just my opinion. Leave me comments. Tell me what you think. And people say, well, you know, other songs during the Beatles' original tenure... Uh, original, you know, in the 60s were edited from different takes, especially in the early days. Or, you know, Strawberry Fields Forever was just two different takes. But you didn't have the, f the futzing that you have on an album like this where you've got mix and match and pitch correction and, I don't know, it just seems a little excessive to me. Uh, one after 909, again, same exact take. This was the only version performed on the rooftop. Um, January 30th. Same take. Just, you know, no fooling around at the end. 
and again, I miss I miss those panned vocals. I just, uh. Now that, see that that's brought out quite a bit that vocal right there, and that's kind of cool. Uh, there was a fantastic interview with these um, engineers that appeared online um, in 2003, and I believe it's gone. I, it was just up for a while and then disappeared. Um, it's from from. Uh, I'm not sure where it's from, but the intro is not in English. Um, looks like it was conducted August of 2003 and published November 13th. Um, they tell you exactly what they did with everything and, and why they did it. Uh, the website was www.jp.dk. But it has a very, very long URL. Um, I'm not going to share it here. As I said, I, last time I checked, this site was gone. Or this link was gone. I don't know where it came from. But, you know, it's quite lengthy. Great great interview. And these guys, you know, are, are have worked on many projects for the Beatles. The John, the John Lennon remixes, uh, the Yellow Submarine song track, uh, and they, I believe they did the recent remasters as well, too. They're, they're kind of the go-to guys. <clears throat> and they do really great work, in my opinion. I mean, you know, even if I may not agree with everything that was done here, they did the best that they could. Uh, given what they were asked to do. Now, don't let me down. Um, you know, I personally think this is probably the best song that came out of those sessions. Originally released as the B-side of Get Back. Um, you know, I prefer... No, I think I prefer that or original version. You've got three-part harmonies here. Um, Paul, J John, and George. Um, it's a little much for me. It doesn't really need it. I guess it, you know, it's kind of nice, but um, I like the original B-side with John, mostly, mostly John singing, and then Paul coming in on those really high harmonies. That's kind of cool. This one's a little busy for me. Also, it's a little, um, a little too in your face. Slightly. Um, I like the B-side version, how it just feels kind of smoky and swampy, like you're in a studio, you know, in the wee hours, listening to these guys. And this is a little more... abrasive maybe S slightly i mean it's still a great song but you know it's one of those beatles songs that i i have a hard time um you know getting sick of it i no matter how much i hear it now they had to do some surgery here too they did two versions of this on the rooftop and john messed up the lyrics in both versions uh the first version was in the film you know, it's a really funny part where he kind of screws up the lyrics and has to make up these funny little nonsense syllables. So naturally, they had to do an edit here. They just had no choice. So the bulk of this is the first performance. And then you get to this part right here, and you jump into the second version. Because this part right here is all, you know, blown lyrics in the, in the first version. You know, I never understood why this wasn't on the original album. People say, well, it came out as a B-side already. Well, you know, Get Back and Let It Be had been singles already. Um, Across the Universe was on the album, and that was a year old. Um, no, I was... 
Well, it had been recorded in February of 1968. Um, and then was resurrected for a World Wildlife Charity Fund album. The wildlife version, as they call it. And then Spectre took the tapes. Well, we'll talk more about that when that comes up. But, um... You know, Across the Universe is on it, and that's quite old, and then you have, you know, two singles on here. This song was in the film. It should have been on the album, in my opinion. I mean, it's, as I said, I, you know, it's, I think it's probably the strongest song on here. Just my opinion. I mean mine. Um, This is Take 16, recorded January 3rd, 1970. This is just Paul, George, and Ringo. Uh, John was absent. Uh, most of this is overdub. And this is another thing, you know, all the press for this out particular album, this version of the album, said, oh, you know, this is just the raw tapes. You know, this is just what we played in the room. Well, there's quite a bit of overdubs on this album. As I said, For You Blue has an overdubbed lead vocal. Um, this has just, you know, a ton of overdubs. They kind of recorded a, the bare bones of a track, and then they kind of went back in that same session, did electric piano, electric guitar, all the vocals, organ, and a second acoustic guitar. You know, as I said, uh, with many of these, same exact take that Spectre chose. Um, now, this was a short piece when the Beatles recorded it, so they so Spectre doubled it in length by, you know, just copying it. Um, the edit point is different in this song. Um, Spectre had taken it after flowing more freely than wine and rewound the tape. These guys take it, took it from uh, after all through your life, took it back. This is a slightly different edit point. But almost all of this is overdubs. And then, of course, uh, as I said, Spectre took this in overdubbed orchestra. Um, the Brass Strings and Choir, April 1st of 1970. I, you know, I, kind of, I think I kind of prefer Spectre's mix. I think the orchestra kind of works. And across the universe, um, as I said, you know, Take 7 recorded February 4th, 1968. Uh, very, very minimal initial recording. It's just guitar and um, George Harrison playing a tambora. Uh, February 8th, you had a lead vocal overdub and a second guitar. Now, there was also tone pedal guitar, maracas, piano, and beetle backing vocals done on the 8th. Um, all of those appeared in the World Wildlife Charity Fund album. Now, also on February 4th, um, in the initial session, they grabbed these two female fans from outside the studio and said, Hey, you want to come in and sing on a beetle record? <laughs> so, uh, Gaylene Peace and uh, Peas and Lizzie Bravo were brought in to do backing vocals. Uh, all, almost all those overdubs were, were mixed out by Phil Spector, and he overdubbed um, Brass Strings and Choir again on April 1st, 1970. Uh, now, another thing Spector did was slow down the tape considerably for the Let It Be album. For some reason, and the World Wildlife Fund version was sped up. So this mix is the first time you have ever heard it at the correct pitch and speed. So that's kind of cool.
and again, you know, overdubs. If you if you took out the overdubs here, you you would have guitar and timbre. You wouldn't even have vocal. And the engineers, you know, made sure to note that in their interview. This is a great song. Um, I, I don't, I don't know that this is my favorite version, though. I I I'm very fond of the one on Anthology Two, which is you know kind of a rough run through, but really nice and has some sort of swirling sounds in it. I think there's... Well, I know there's a tambora, but there's some other things going on, too. And it seems, like, just about right. Whereas all these other versions... There's either too little or too much. I don't know. It's hard. I, I kind of feel like there's never been a perfect version of this song. Even though it's a great song. Now, when Yoko Ono first heard the rough mix of this album, uh, the Let It, Let It Be Naked, that is, um, she said that one of John's songs sounded terrible and she had to go into the studio and fix it herself. I've never been able to figure out or find out what song that was, but I'm assuming it's this one. And I don't know, I don't know what she's referring to, but I would love to know. If you know, please leave a comment. So I've researched that and researched that and cannot find any answer. Now let it be. Um, this is a little. This is interesting. Um, the original album version and the single version was Take Twenty Seven A, recorded January thirty first, nineteen sixty nine. Um, this was overdubbed on January 4th, 1970, with background vocals, brass, drums, maracas, cellos, and a new, then-unused lead guitar part. And this was all for the single, and over overseen by George Martin, their producer. Um, now, when Phil Spector took this tape, he opted for that unused guitar solo, which is the much more rocking, stinging guitar solo from George. Um, and he added, you know, a bunch of tape echo to the hi-hat, which is kind of a strange thing. Um, so all, all that, you know, um, orchestra and everything was done by George Martin for the single, so so Spectre didn't, didn't overdub that. Uh, now, there's also another overdub on this, and uh, again, you know, it's something that I have never been able to figure out. Um, the bass guitar is definitely Paul, and I have not been able to find out a date for that. Another interesting thing is Linda McCartney is in this song doing a backing vocal, um, and I haven't read too much info on that, but... You know, I, I'm guessing it came January 4th, 1970, when all these other overdubs happened. So again, you know, slightly betraying the the ethos here of, well, it's just the band, it's just raw tapes. Well, they, you know, they, Linda McCartney's on this album. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Not that I mind, but it just, you know... Now this, you know, right here, you can you can tell this is John Lennon playing the bass because it's very simple, you know, just tonics and a little bit of, you know. Um, but there is a, definitely a Paul McCartney bass line on here. Now, one cool thing about this version of this song is um, it fixes a mistake in this last verse here. Um, Paul McCartney, even on the original, you know, single and album version that we all know, he plays a wrong piano chord, and they fix that here by editing um, take twenty seven B, a section from that into this. Um, I'll show you where it is. The wrong chord was right here. He just hits the wrong chord. So all this is from 27B right here. 27B is also the version that's used in the film. And um, again, these were recorded January 4th, 
um, I'm sorry, January 31st, 1969, in um, the basement of Apple. Um, the guitar solo in this version is also, um, you know, the original guitar solo. It's not the overdubbed one that George did. And I kind of prefer that album, the album solo. So, there you have it. That is Let It Be Naked. Um, yeah, I, um, you know, I had, a, I had issues with this when it came out, and then I kind of grew used to the sound and everything, and I do think that um, it's an improvement in some ways but not in others. As I said before, you know, it's kind of strange to, to say, well, the, the version that's the true version is the one that was the most digitally edited and, you know, enhanced and sort of Frankensteined. Uh, it's a nice listen. It's definitely much more, much more of an aerodynamic album. Uh, it's just short, all the songs. Um, but I don't know. Um, I, th I think, uh, you know, I'm going to go through each track real, real briefly and just kind of, um, you know, tell you which version I prefer. Uh, get back, um, I would probably take the single, because you have, uh, the coda on it and you have a little bit of reverb, um, yeah, probably. Um, Dig a Pony would definitely go with the original just because you know um the vocals are are spread out and it's not so diced um and you don't have that note that's pitch corrected which i think is just really overkill i'd, pro I'd probably go with the original i like the way the guitars sound better on the original as well as i said before for you blue i would choose this version i definitely think it's an improvement i really like the acoustic guitar Long and Winding Road, um, you know, I'm split. Um, not one of my favorite Beatles songs anyway, so this is definitely a stronger core performance. Um, so it really just kind of falls down to whether you like the orchestra or not that Phil Spector put on there and the choir. Um, I don't know. I, I don't really care either way. Um, just... You know, I'm not a big fan of that song, I guess. Two of Us, um... <coughs> Probably go with the original. Again, I like those panned vocals, and, um, I like... I, I miss the, um... The kind of... Whist well, what they did is they did, like, a manual fade. And by that, I mean they all just kind of were playing quieter and quieter and quieter and singing quieter. And that's how the original ends. And in this, you just have them, you know, panning down, or you know, fading, fading out. Um, so I kind of miss the whistling at the end and the manual fade, um, and I miss the vocal panning. So I'd go, I'd probably go with the original. I've got a feeling would definitely go with the original. I like that it's one complete take, and and I like the call and sort of call and response vocal at the end, uh, in different channels. Go the original. Um, one after 909, uh, it's a toss up. Um, probably the original again. You know, I, I like those, those, you know, spread out vocals and I like the rawness of the electric guitars better. Uh, Don't Let Me Down, B side, original B side version. Um, I Mean Mine kind of split tempted to go with the with Spectre's version I, I actually think the orchestra works on that cut uh, kind of like what he did on the overdubs across the universe anthology 2 um, you know all, that's a, that's one of the songs where I think all the versions have their own merits 
you know, it's kind of hard to choose. Um, they all have, they all have something that the other versions don't, unfortunately. So, you know, I, I think I'd go Anthology 2 and let it be, um, don't know. Uh, you know, again, another, another one where there's elements of all of them that are great. Um, the original single had the orchestra kind of back in the mix, which was nice. Um, the album version has that great guitar solo. Um, but this fixes that piano error, and it's it's more stripped back, and it's basically mostly just, you know kind of the band playing. So it's just it's a toss up for me. Um, I don't know. I don't know. That's a tough one. Um, so basically, what you have here is you know this is kind of a fantasy album. This is. Um, what could have been, but if they'd had modern day technology, because you know they would never have been able to release this version back then. You know, there's just too many edits and fly-ins and, and things going on. It, it would have been impossible for the most part. This is a fantasy album, and um, you know when this came out, they did a, um, a live broadcast over the radio of this and then they had this round table discussion which is kind of funny because they had musicians like Billy Joel and Sheryl Crow um, but then they had like Geraldo Rivera come in and make comments which is kind of random it was hosted by Pat O'Brien so you know it's kind of strange too um, but David Frick was part of the round table as well now he's a Rolling Stone um, writer I believe he's editor now one of the higher ups. Uh, he's one of the few music journalists I really like. This guy's just about. Uh, this guy's right on just about, you know, all the time. Every time I see him in an interview or something, I read a piece that he wrote. You know, he's pretty dead on. I really like this guy, um, and he kind of summed it up perfectly in the roundtable discussion. He said, um, "You can't really have." this version without the Spectre version, um, there's just too too much missing. And it should have been a double album. And I, I, I think that was the best assessment of this. Um, and on that note, you know, um, you know they, they, they obviously removed Maggie May and Dig It from this version of the album. Um, you know, I don't... They were nice kind of trifles on the original album. They're fun. Not real heartbroken that they're gone. Um, I don't know. I could go either way on those. You know, they were just kind of informal in jam. You know, in the studio jams, really. They were added to the album to kind of just give it a rough feel, kind of give you a taste of what they were doing. You know, in those um, early sessions for this album. Um, so, um, yeah. Um, and, and you know, that, on that note, this is an album I really liked growing up. My dad had has it on vinyl, so I, I've heard this album, you know, I heard it so much when I was growing up. It was one of the first Beatle albums I heard, and I always liked it. And then as you get older, you start reading too much. You start learning too much. I read about the sessions and how terrible they were and, how, you know, how much tension there was. And then I started saying, well, you know what, this album's terrible. This album, you know, I don't like it anymore. Um, you know, I... Um, but I've kind of come back the other way now. Um, not my favorite Beatles album by any stretch, The Imagination, but it's a classic. It has a lot of great songs on it, either version, really. Um, and I can listen to it the whole way through. I don't have to skip anything on here, on either version. Um... Especially the Spectre version, which, you know, in some ways you could say I prefer, because I like, you know, some of his mixing choices and stuff. Um, you know, this album gets a bad rap by a lot of people. Oh, the nadir of the Beatles' career or whatever. But um, I'm, I don't subscribe to that anymore. Um, it's kind of ridiculous. <laughs> uh, 
Um, a lot of good stuff. You know, not my favorite, but I'd put it somewhere in the middle, probably. Um, you know, you just, sometimes you know too much about these things and, and you start to get too cynical about it, I think. So, um, I think that's basically it. Um, I think I went through everything that I needed to um, in terms of this, and there was a lot. Um, so, uh, yeah, you know, here we are, 2013, this is 10 years later, and we still don't have a good version of this um, film anywhere. So, um, you know, as, as far as I know, they have a b really nicely remastered version of this just sitting in the vaults. Um, sort of a director's cut with all this new footage, but the, the you know, the Beatles and, and the estates of the of the deceased Beatles, they just can't agree to put it out. They don't, it's depressing, and there's too much fighting, and, you know, I really wish it would, though. I mean, it's a historical document, and it's, it's fun to watch, well, sort of fun. Um, you know, back, I got this, first saw this back in high school, um, it was impossible to buy really next to impossible to rent, but a friend had a, a copy of a rental, and I borrowed it and copied it, so I had this bad copy of it, and I used to watch it all the time, and just thought it was so cool, um, and then I know there's a Japanese laser disc version, and that's kind of where all the bootlegs have come from, and, you know, most of it, like, if you find it on a torrent or something, odds are it comes from that Japanese laser disc, because that's the highest fidelity that you can find this in now. It's just kind of a shame, so... Um, hopefully we will get a DVD or Blu-ray release here at some point. They gotta do it. You know, they, and they've got tons and tons of extra stuff they could put on it. Um, just hours of footage if they wanted to. I would love to see a complete rooftop concert on there too. Um, because the, ver you know, the film only has like five, six, six run-throughs, I think, out of the concert. And I think there's a couple, mi yeah, there's a couple missing. So, anyway, um... This has been my live, uh, you know, commentary of Let It Be Naked. I hope you've learned something. I hope I've cleared up uh, some of the misconceptions that have come out about this album through the years. Please leave me comments, ask me questions, and I will do what I can to respond. Um, you know, thanks for watching this whole thing all the way through, if you have. And, um, yeah, I think that's about it. So, um, thanks again, and uh, I'll see you later.